This is Dr. Dave Mathewson in his hermeneutics course, lecture number 20 on the apocalyptic genre. Another feature of uh, interpreting and reading a New Testament epistolary literature or re letters is to realize that uh, the possibility of uh, within the broader category of letter or epistle <clears throat> in the first century, but especially in the New Testament, is the possibility of uh, recognizing subtypes in the same way that even in, in our own day and age, uh, under the broader category of a letter, we might have different, you know, a, a letter that one would write to a family member would be very different than a letter of complaint that one might write to a company or a letter, a cover letter for a job application. Uh, so in, in the first century, there also appears to be a number of subtypes of letters that uh, <clears throat> may uh, correspond to certain New Testament letters as well. For example, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, the the book of Philemon, or the letter to Philemon, the shortest letter written by Paul, uh, seems to correspond fairly closely to a possible subtype of letter known as a letter of recommendation or a letter of introduction. And usually what that entailed was, uh, was the, the, auth, the writer would introduce or recommend a certain person uh, to someone else, often asking for a favor uh, in, in, in and intending then or, or promising to sort of return, uh, return the favor. Uh, to the, the recipient. In other words, when you read the letter to Philemon, is Philemon uh, or Paul introduces Onesimus, uh, the other main character, the author is Paul, but Philemon is the main recipient. Uh, Paul introduces Phile uh, Onesimus to Philemon because Onesimus, while pre uh, uh, a slave of uh, Philemon who had uh, run away, now has become a, a Christian through and has been converted through uh, Paul's ministry. Now Paul writes a re letter of recommendation or introduction to send him back and introduce him to Philemon, the recipient, and also asks Philemon for a favor, uh, promising then uh, to do something for Philemon. So it's almost as if Philemon, reading this letter, would recognize his obligation uh, to respond in the way that Paul has asked. Or, for example, the book of Philippians has often been labeled a family letter, uh, corresponding, having certain sections of it that correspond to uh, what is known as a family letter, and some of the language uh, perhaps reflecting that. A couple of letters may correspond to what is known as a testament, which wasn't so much a letter in the first century, but uh, uh, rather a, a, an actual literary genre that is a testament was the, sort of the last words of a dying hero as, as a, a, a person was on his deathbed and had his family and friends surrounding him. It was the final instructions to the followers as the person was about ready to die, which included both exhortation and sometimes eschatological uh, prediction in it. Uh, you find the uh, you, you find at least two books that seem to rec uh, correspond to possibly to a testament, and uh, one of them is First uh, Second Peter chapter one uh, and verses fourteen and fifteen seem to reflect uh, uh, the uh, language of a testament. That is uh, Peter on his deathbed in a sense. Now these are his final instructions as he's about ready to pass uh, from this life. These are his final instructions to his followers. Uh, starting with verse uh, 13, I'll back up. I th this is chapter 1, 2 Peter, verse 13. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I le live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. And you find similar language in 2 Timothy as well, uh, so that both of these le uh, letters, 2 uh, Peter 
and Second Timothy uh, may take the form of a, a testament in, in epistolary form. That is the final instructions to the followers of the, these individuals right before they die. Uh, in Second Timothy, Paul is speaking in uh, sort of his final words as he faces execution. And uh, both of them could be classified as testamentary type of letters. The final instructions of, of a dying hero or the final instructions of Paul and Peter to their followers uh, right before they pass from the scene. One issue <clears throat> related to epistolary literature is uh, how we understand authorship. Uh, just very briefly, as kind of a digression, but related to issues of genre, uh, because uh, it, interestingly, we just talked about testaments. Most of the testaments that we have in uh, copies of, or uh, 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 in, I referred earlier to a book by by uh, James Charlesworth, the New, T the Old Testament pseudepigrapha. In those volumes, you can find uh, reference to a number of testaments, English translations of a number of of uh, testamentary type of literature. Most of them are, are what are known as pseudonymous, that is, they're written in the name of someone else. It's a, a later figure writing in the name of or as if uh, the, an earlier figure is writing long after their death. And some, therefore, have suggested that some of the New Testament letters uh, may also be pseudonymous. Is it possible that a few of the letters in the New Testament, such as Second Peter or Second Timothy, uh, were written by a pseudonym. That is, after Paul and Peter had died, uh, could someone, one of their followers, picked up a pen and written a letter in their name? And therefore, no one would have been deceived by this. No one would have uh, been fooled into thinking that Peter or Paul actually wrote this, but they would have recognized, based on the literary genre, that uh, someone else was writing in their name. Uh, the question is whether this was an acceptable device, not only in the first century, but would this have been an acceptable device among New Testament authors? And would this have been an acceptable device within the parameters of the New Testament canon? Uh, I think, number one, a good arguments can probably be made for the authorship of all the letters by the person named. Uh, though I, I would admit Second Peter is far more difficult, and even some Christian or evangelical scholars have recognized the difficulty, even though while retaining uh, Peter as the author of the letter. But second, it's, it's not clear to me that pseudonymity would have been an acceptable canonical device. That, would, it, that is, it would have been an acceptable device recognized among New Testament authors, especially as the, the canon was being recognized and formed that uh, those letters that would have been pseudonymous would, uh, uh, it's not clear that they would have been accepted and that would have been an acceptable device. But on the other hand, even if we reject pseudonymity, that is writing in someone else's name, again, long after the actual author is dead, a follower or disciple would have picked up the pen and written in that person's name, even if we reject that. As we've already seen, it's not necessary to hold that the authors physically wrote every last word found in the document. We've already talked about the manuenses, uh, that is that, uh, and this could sometimes account perhaps for the difference between the letter. Uh, some persons feel that uh, Peter could not have written Second Peter because it, the, the theology is different, the language and style is very different. Uh, some have suggested this could be accounted for by by utilizing a different amanuensis, or sometimes an amanuensis, that is a scribe or secretary that you dictate a letter to. At times, some of them may have been given slightly more freedom uh, so that they, they uh, uh, perhaps would have composed much of the letter, but the author still would have signed off on that letter. So uh, again, that uh, what is written is exactly what Paul or Peter or whoever uh, 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 wanted to be written and would have signed off on and agreed upon as accurately uh, communicating what they wanted to communicate. 
Uh, we saw this with chapter 16 of Romans in verse 22, where Tertius is mentioned as the author, or the, the, probably the, the scribe or the amanuensis, who has actually written the letter. Uh, we find something else very interesting in a couple of Paul's letters. One example in Galatians, in the very last chapter, chapter 5, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 6. And notice what Paul says. I'll start with, um, I'll start reading with chapter 6 and about verse, uh, verse 11. He says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. It's possible that that refers to the entire letter, but is it possible, though, that this reflects uh, uh, something that you sometimes see in other ancient letters, and that is uh, at, towards the end of the letter when an author has dictated the letter to a scribe or amanuensis, the author would often take up the pen and sign it in his own name or produce the greeting in his own name. So is it possible that Galatians, when you get to chapter 6 and verse 11, that now Paul takes up the pen himself and writes the final greeting and finishes off, off the letter. Uh, so uh, epistolary literature was produced in, in a variety of ways, mainly by utilizing an amanuensis or scribe or something like that, uh, which sometimes might account for some of the differences one finds in the letter. But uh, I will proceed with the assumption that the New Testament letters have uh, been produced by the persons, have been written by the persons uh, uh, whose name they bear in, in the introductions to the letters. Uh, one other feature just to mention before we just look at a handful of principles for interpreting epistolary literature is uh, I've already expressed my uh, cautions and misgivings about uh, rhetorical approaches, that is, uh, identifying letters, especially Paul's letters, as examples of rhetorical speeches, deliberative speeches or judicial speeches or epideictic speeches. Not that there aren't some similarities and not that there can't be some value in comparing the function of them to certain sections of Paul's letters. Not that Paul never uses rhetorical argumentation or things like that, but uh, it, it seems to me that uh, it's I, I think questionable to take rhetorical speeches of the first century and impose them on uh, uh, New Testament letters. Instead, again, when you look at the formal features of the letters, when you look at the clues the author leaves himself, it appears that uh, New Testament authors are writing what is nothing less, however different uh, they are writing nothing less than a typical first century letter with uh, the, the introduction or salutation, the thanksgiving, the body, uh, conclusion and greetings, and using typical device, devices to indicate that that is indeed what they're doing. <clears throat> uh, so I won't, I won't uh, repeat uh, my discussion or arguments for uh, uh, Paul primarily writing first century letters and not rhetorical uh, speeches. Uh, let me end by just uh, drawing this together and highlighting just a handful of principles or guidelines for reading and interpreting first century letters that uh, rise out of the kind of literature it is. Uh, first of all, is it's important in interpreting first century letters to reconstruct the historical setting and occasion. We've already mentioned that New Testament letters are highly occasional. Uh, responses to specific per, uh, problems and issues in the early church. So uh, based on the letter itself and based on any information we can gather about the first century uh, situation, uh, it's important to try to reconstruct what most likely was the problem or issue or situation that Paul is addressing or Peter is addressing or the James is addressing, and then how is the letter seen as a response to that. Second, I think it's also important to follow the argument of the letter to note how the thought develops. Again, even more so the narrative uh, is asking how the sentences and clauses, how does the, 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 the at, at both the sentence level and verse level, but also the paragraph level, to be able to tell, uh, explain 
how the argument develops, to be able to trace the argument of the letter from section to section. For example, just to give you a very quick example, a text that we'll return to later on, uh, but uh, towards the end of this course, but in Romans chapter 6 and verses 1 through 11, well, we find a good example of how uh, it, it's important to, under, to, to trace the argument of the text. Uh, first of all, chapter 6, uh, chapter 6 of Romans begins with a typical question-answer format that uh, Paul follows. There's more to be said about this that we'll say later. But uh, frequently, Paul will raise a question which appears to be a potential objection to something he's just said, and then he'll answer that question. So notice chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? That's the question that he raises. The first thing to note then is that it's based on something Paul has previously said. And it's, uh, this is probably just the, a way of Paul uh, perhaps anticipating possible objections that the readers might have, not necessarily real objections that may have been voiced, although it could, but it's, it's probably just a way of raising possible objections that someone might have, especially his, that his readers might have, and that, but using it also to advance his own argument. So if you look at chapter 6, this question, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase, probably grows out of something he said back in chapter 5. In verses 20 and 21, the very last two chapters, he says, the law was added, this is chapter 5 of Romans, verse 20, the law was added so that trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned uh, in death, so also grace may, might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So a possible objection or possible question that could be raised, well, if 20 is true, if where sin increases, grace increases all the more, should I sin more so that grace may increase all the more? And that's precisely the question Paul raises. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? The rest, of verses, uh, the rest of this chapter, verses 2 through 11, can be seen as a response to that question, uh, as the answer. No, uh, in fact, the, the answer is in two forms, kind of a, an, initial, an initial outburst, by no means may it never be, followed more by a, a logical explanation. Uh, we cannot go on sinning because we've been united to Christ who has died to sin. We've died to sin because we've been united to Christ who himself has died to sin and who has raised us to live in newness of life. That makes that question absurd. Uh, so it's important to be able to trace the argument, to, to understand how the argument flows and how it fits. We'll talk more about that when we look at uh, issues of literary context uh, later on in a subsequent session. So it's, it's important to be able to follow the argument, to trace the argument, not to just summarize the content, but actually to be able to, to explain how it develops and uh, how, the, how the, the author develops his argument and his point. A third one, a, a, a third important principle in interpreting epistolary literature is to recognize, again, what section you're dealing with are, are you dealing with, uh, if, if you're interpreting a text, are you dealing with a text that is part of a thanksgiving or part of the body, part of the exhortational section, and what difference that might be, make in the way you read it? Again, particularly whether the author has expanded something and is doing something unique. And then fourth, uh, see if your letter perhaps belongs to a subgenre, uh, such as, Philemon perhaps belonging to a genre, subgenre known as a letter of recommendation, and whether that might make a difference in the way that you interpret the epistle. The third literary genre, or uh, actually I would say the third, uh, perhaps better, the third book that it represents uh, 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 at least two or three genres is in the New Testament is the book of Revelation. Uh, the book of Revelation seems to, to be able to be identified, although I'm not, I'm not convinced the first readers would have clearly separated 
between all three of these, uh, but uh, three literary types that seem to emerge from the text of Revelation is uh, uh, what is known as apocalypse and prophecy and a letter. Uh, the author himself, as we'll see, clearly identifies his work as a prophecy, and it actually uh, begins and ends just like one of Paul's letters. It also fits, it, it seems to have characteristic features, especially in chapters 4 through 22, seems to have characteristic features of an ancient writing that uh, we have labeled an apocalypse. We'll look at that in a moment. Uh, the, the difficulty is with at least one of these, uh, there is no precise analogy in our modern day world. Uh, in, in other words, uh, we're... We're familiar with letters. We write and we read letters. But uh, when's the last time you sit down, sat down and read an apocalypse? Or when's the last time you sat down and wrote an apocalypse to someone? Uh, so that genre, uh, genre criticism or an understanding of literary genre is, is very important here and helps us particularly in this book to avoid misunderstanding. As we said, literary genre functions mainly as kind of an entry point into the genre to, to get us off on the right foot, to get us off to the right start in interpreting the book, though it doesn't solve all the interpretive issues, difficulties. One still has to follow internally how the book develops and, and unfolds. It's, it's sort of own internal genre. But uh, uh, usually misunderstandings of the book of Revelation come by failing to note these three genres, of, of apocalypse, prophecy, and letter, and a, f a failure to recognize them or to misunderstand what they are. Uh, often, a uh, failure to understand all three of these and what kind of book it is, is what uh, gives rise to misunderstandings of Revelation, particularly at the popular level where uh, Revelation is used to do all kinds of strange things. Uh, but uh, what we want to do is briefly, as kind of an entry point into the book of Revelation, is briefly describe these three literary types, uh, these three uh, literary genres. Again, uh, Revelation clearly intends to be read as an epistle or as an, a letter. In fact, when you read the very f beginning, the very first chapter, uh, at least starting with verse 4, it sounds like you're, in a sense, reading one of Paul's letters. Notice how verse 4, uh, John, there's the identification of the writer, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. There's the identification of the readers. Grace and peace to you. Sounds just like one of Paul's letters. But notice how this gets expanded. Again, so I would want I would sit up and pay attention to this. The, the grace and peace, the greeting part gets expanded. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before the throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by the, his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory forever and ever, glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So that's, that's your epistolary introduction, the, the salutation. And notice also Revelation ends like a typical letter. It ends uh, uh, verses 20 and especially 21. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. Verse 21. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Which is a, a common way of finding New Testament letters ended. So Revelation clearly uh, uh, intends to be read as a letter. And I don't think this is inconsequential. I think it's illegitimate to overlook that and ignore it. Uh, but second, notice that the author clearly intends to, or clearly indicates that he's intending to write a prophecy. Uh, verse, notice the first uh, couple verses of this book, uh, especially verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it because the time is near. 
in chapter 22 again, he will identify the very end of the book, kind of the bookends, very end of the book, he will identify his work as a prophecy and warn those who hear the words of this prophecy uh, not, to, uh, not to ignore them and disobey them. And also uh, uh, in a, another place in chapter 22, clearly identifies this as a prophecy. So uh, the the book of the letter uh, the, the the book of Revelation has all the has the beginning and ending features of a letter. It, it indicates John's intention to write a letter to these seven churches in Asia Minor. He clearly identifies his work as a prophecy as well. But chapter one and verse one also indicates John's intention uh, to record another type of literature. That is, he begins by saying the revelation or apocalypse of Jesus Christ, the word revelation here comes from the Greek word apokalupsis or apocalypse, uh, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Uh, Now, it's from this verse that we get the label for a literary genre, apocalypse. I doubt that John is using a revelation or apocalypse here as a label of a genre, uh, of a literary type. Uh, That came much later. But at the same time, by calling this a revelation of Jesus Christ, which he shows to, to, uh, to the prophets and to John, is clearly John intends this book to belong to a, a literary genre of revelatory literature. It's to be taken as a revelation, a divine revelation of, of God to John. But as you read the rest of the book of Revelation, especially chapters 4 through 22, we'll see in just a moment that it it actually contains most of the features typical in a group of writing, typical to a group of writings that we now label as apocalypse or apocalyptic literature. And we'll start with that one. We'll start to examine uh, the literary genre apocalypse. Again, apocalypse is the term that we use to describe this group of writings that share similar features to which Revelation appears to belong and which derives its name actually from Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, the apocalypse or the revelation of Jesus Christ. But just so you know, apocalypse is a modern label. It's not necessarily one that was used by John and the earliest writers to label their works. Yet at the same time, uh, there, there clearly seems to be a group of writings that have recognizable similarities and similar features, and we'll talk about what they are. So the first literary type is what is known as an apocalypse that Revelation seems to belong to. Again, apocalypse is a term that we use to describe a group of writings that were produced roughly during the period of 200 B.C. to 200 A.D., Uh, Works such as Daniel and uh, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament and the book of Revelation in the New Testament. And by the way, uh, much of what I'm going to say uh, would apply to Daniel as well as the book of Revelation since they seem to share the same literary features and belong to the same literary genre. But there were other Jewish and Christian apocalypses produced during this time of roughly 200 B.C. to 200 A.D. that are not included in the Old New Testament. As I've already mentioned before, you can find English translations of most of these documents uh, collected in a a two-volume work by James Charles Worth called the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. Uh, Chapter, or, or volume number one, contains English translation by a variety of scholars of most of these apocalypses. Or an easier way, if you want to Google, uh, type in the name of the apocalypse and you often you can find English translations online. But what these are is uh, apocalypses are basically narrative accounts, first-person narrative accounts of the visionary experience of the revelatory experience of a human right, human being. And f- having had that revelatory experience, now they give a narrative account, a, re- a report of what it was they saw. Sometimes this visionary experience is in the form of a dream. We find that going on in Daniel. Sometimes it, there's, it's an f- actual visionary transport. The person has 
uh, a, a, an experience where it's almost as if they're they're almost an out of body type experience where they are transported by God's Spirit to certain locations to see different things. Uh, so. Uh, Common behind all of these is some type of visionary experience where they see things and now they record them for the, these visions for the benefit of their audience. The visions usually contain, are visions of the heavenly world. Sometimes they have visions of heaven or hell, the place of judgment. Uh, often these are visions of eschatological end time events as well. Uh, probably the most, the most popular definition uh, that uh, I've come, one of the more helpful ones I've come across, but I find it repeated in almost every book. Almost every book that deals with apocalyptic literature uh, quotes this definition or at least uses it as a starting point. And this was a definition by uh, a scholar named John Collins, who has done a lot of work on apocalyptic literature. And he defined an apocalypse as this he says, an apocalypse is a genre of revelatory literature within a narrative framework in which a revelation is mediated by an otherworldly being, usually an angel, to a human recipient, disclosing a transcendent reality which is both temporal insofar as it envisions eschatological salvation and which is spatial insofar as it involves another supernatural world. Uh, now, let me unpack this definition Again, let me say it one more time, uh, since most of you are listening to this. An apocalypse is a genre of revelatory literature, literature that communicates a revelation, within a narrative framework in which a revelation is mediated by an otherworldly being, an angelic being, to a human recipient, disclosing a transcendent reality which is both temporal insofar as it envisions uh, eschatological salvation, and is spatial insofar as it involves another supernatural world. So let me just un uh, briefly unpack this definition. Number one is it's important to understand in this definition that an apocalypse is a record of a revelation to a human recipient. Uh, so the human recipient would be, in our case, John, but would be the author of the apocalypse, who has a revelatory experience, uh, primarily through means of vision, and now records that. Uh, number two, notice that it's a narrative of that account. So uh, apocalyptic literature can, in a sense, be treated like narrative literature. It's a narration of something that the author has experienced and seen uh, through this revelation, this revelatory experience. A third part of this definition that is important is that this revelation is primarily about a transcendent perspective. What that means is it's primarily a revelation about something that transcends the present visible earthly world. Uh, so it's, it's kind of an out of this world experience. Now we'll see that does not mean that the author doesn't that, that this world is unimportant and it's kind of an escape to a, to a heavenly reality, a heavenly existence. It's not quite that, but it, it, it is a revelation of a world and a reality that transcends the physical world that can be seen by the human eye. And uh, so the only appropriate way for someone to know this transit, transcendent reality is to have it revealed to him or her. So uh, apocalypse is about a transcendent reality. It, it provides a transcendent perspective by opening up the reader, the, the, list, the, the seer, the, this human recipient, by opening him or her up to this transcendent reality that, as we'll see, is meant to cast a new perspective on the physical earthly reality that they live in. So it's not meant to be a means of escape, but it's meant to open their physical world up to, to be understood in light of this transcendent reality, this transcendent perspective that can only be known through a direct revelation. Apart from a revelation and this visionary experience uh, through this other supernatural being, this otherworldly being, 
human recipients simply couldn't know it. Uh, there's two features of this transcendent perspective. Number one, in this definition, it's often temporal. That is, it refers to eschatology or the end of the world. Uh, the, the, the trans, in other words, a vision that transcends time. It goes beyond their time to uh, include uh, temporally the eschatological end. But it's also spatial in that uh, the fifth thing is it's spatial. That is, the vision, the transcendent perspective is usually of a heavenly world. It introduces them to a heavenly reality, a heavenly world. Again, one that could not be seen merely by uh, human perception. So, uh, again, what this means is the, the fact that it's both temporal and spatial is uh, apocalypses are not just about the future. Often we've read books like Revelation or Daniel just about future events. But it's also to, to reveal a, a different reality, a different perspective, a, a, a heavenly world, a, a different perspective on reality and life. Uh, we'll talk more about that. But two other things I want to add uh, to uh, this definition of apocalyptic literature is, first of all, is this transcendent reality of, that's about temporally about the future, but also spatially about the heavenly world, is communicated and couched in highly symbolic language. If one of the things you, you note when reading the apocalypse is, is how they communicate through very graphic imagery. Oftentimes they'll use animal imagery. Uh, often they'll use imagery that sometimes it's a combination of animals and human things and other things that, that, that uh, reveal rather uh, uh, bizarre at times symbols. Uh, and Revelation as well uh, primarily communicates, perhaps even one of the features that some think is even more prevalent in Revelation than other apocalypses is, is the uh, amount of symbolism that one finds in it. For example, this is, um, this is Revelation chapter 9, and uh, uh, chapters 8 and 9 are, uh, are an account in Revelation of the vision of the author's vision of the pouring out of seven bowls, and as each bowl is poured out in the earth, something happens. And uh, notice in chapter 9, uh, notice how, what, what the author sees. And the, uh, kind of the strange, uh, the, uh, this is the fifth bowl that's poured out. Or I'm sorry, the fifth trumpet. I have the trumpet and bowls. The bowls come later. This is the trumpets. As the fifth trumpet is sounded in chapter 9, uh, something happens and these locusts come out. And, and I want you to note how he describes these locusts. We might talk about these later, but right now I'm just interested in you seeing the symbolism and the, the kind of the, the, the graphic nature of the imagery and how the symbols sometimes are, are put together in ways, at least to us, that are kind of strange, uh, though they may not have been so strange to the first readers. But uh, chapter 9, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given a key to the shaft of the abyss. When, the, when he opened the abyss, smoke came out of it, uh, like smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and skies were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Uh, they were not given power to kill them, but only torture them for five months, <clears throat> uh, which was uh, five months was, was probably the common lifestyle of a, of a locust in, in, uh, during that time in the first century. And the agony they suffered was like the sting of a scorpion. So these are locusts that can harm people and sting them uh, in the same way that a scorpion can. Uh, <clears throat> let me skip down to starting of verse 7 where they, they begin to be described. The locusts look like horses prepared for battle. Now you have these locusts that kind of look like horses. On their heads they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces were like human faces, their hair was like a woman's hair. Their teeth were like a lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. 
They had tails that stung like scorpions. And in their tails, they had the power to torment people for five months. And they had a king over them, uh, that, which was the angel of the abyss. Uh, so here you have John, in John seeing a vision of these locusts, but uh, they're cer- certainly more than locusts. They have tails like scorpions that can sting and cause harm. They have human-like heads with crowns on them and uh, a face like a man but hair like a woman and teeth like a lion. I mean, what, what in the world is this thing that John is looking at? What is this that he sees in his vision? But my point at, th- at, at this stage in our discussion is simply to note that the graphic symbolism and the, the description of the symbols and what John sees in his vision. So you have the, the, the earth, this transcendent reality of the, of the eschatological future temporally, and also the heavenly world is communicated in highly symbolic language. The, the second thing I would add to this definition is an emphasis on the function. The function of apocalypse seems to be to both console and exhort God's people uh, based on this transcendent perspective. So by providing a transcendent perspective on reality, uh, an apocalypse is able to motivate the readers to, to uh, obedience to God and his word. It, it functions to console those who are suffering, but also to exhort, uh, to exhort God's readers to bring them in line uh, with uh, uh, how God desires his people to live. So, in other words, apocalypses, again, are not just there for speculation about the future and about heaven, Although sometimes some other apocalypses might engage in some of that, but primarily uh, they have they, they function to exhort and console God's people. They have a, a hortatory purpose. When it, it, uh, it comes to understanding then apocalypses, to to look a little bit more at this idea of a transcendent perspective and what what an apocalypse like Revelation does. Basically, what it does is it it then functions to open up the present to this new and transcendent perspective. That is, Revelation and, and other apocalypses are not meant to just be fantasy literature. Again, it's, it's not meant to provide an escape. It's not just a way of escaping this world by providing this, this heavenly alternative kind of fantasy world that the readers can escape to. But instead... It's meant to help the readers see their present world in a new light. As they look out, as as many apocalypses did, and and as many apocalypses presupposed, as the readers looked out at their empirical world where they were often in situations of, of foreign domination, where some of them may be oppressed by the foreign domination, or maybe some of them were... Uh, elites and compromising with and, and, and participating in the foreign, sit, the foreign influence and foreign rule, uh, what an apox- apocalypse did is it, it cast a different perspective on their empirical world. As they looked out on it, what an apocalypse said is things aren't all that they appear to be. What you see with the eye in your in, your, in the physical world, under foreign rulership, etc., everything that's going on in their situation, what you see is only part of the story. That's not all that there is. What an apocalypse says is there is a, a reality that lies beyond what you see, but that is related to it and influences it and, and will help you see it and respond to it and live in it in a new light. Uh, a, a revelation that can only be known, or a, I'm sorry, a reality, a perspective that can only be known through a divine revelation. So again, an apocalypse then reveals a transcendent reality about the future and about the heavenly world that shapes how the author or how the readers will should look at their present world by sh- by opening up their present world that, that uh, they see empirically and experience empirically by opening it up to a transcendent perspective, a heavenly reality, reality that lies behind it but influences it, and a future uh, that reader then is able to see their present in a new light. I often compare this to watching a play. 
Uh, if you ever have been to watch a, a play or performance, uh, whether at a school or more professionally done, uh, usually all you see is what's going on in the stage. You see the actors performing and interacting with each other, and you watch the story all the way to the conclusion. Uh, sometimes what you don't see is what goes beyond behind the cur- what goes on behind the curtain that makes the play work. You don't see the manager and the stage directors. You don't see the technicians uh, gov- with all uh, making the lighting work, and you don't see the the prop people and the costume people all at work to make this state this play work all you see is the play Uh, if if you were to lift the curtain so you you could see backstage behind the scenes you might find everything that makes that work and everything that helps make sense of that play or uh, the play can be made sense of its own but you'll see the workings that that make it work uh, and have brought it about apocalypse does that in a sense uh, it, it lifts the curtain behind history and, and earthly reality to expose you to a heavenly reality and to a future that makes sense of what's going on in the present. And so in light of this knowledge of the heavenly world and the future that is made available only through a divine revelation, the readers are now enabled to see their situation in a new light. Uh, again, empirically, what they see in their world is not all there is. There's a, another reality that lies behind it that helps them to see it in a new light. And both Daniel and Revelation are written in the context of struggle to live life out in a pagan environment and under a pagan empire where some, in fact, are, are, being, uh, are uh, objects of oppression and are suffering, but others are compromising and willing to participate in that uh, pagan domination and pagan empire and system. And what Daniel and Revelation does then, what they do is present a transcendent perspective, open up the reader's perception to see a heavenly reality and a future that should determine the way they respond to their situation in the present. So that's sort of what an apocalypse does. Again, a revelation then, I take it, is trying to help the readers living in a first century, as I'll demonstrate later, living in this first century Roman Empire dominated by Rome. Uh, when they look out empirically, they see uh, the emperor seated on the throne. They see Roman domination. They see all the good things Rome has done for the world. But John in Revelation says, let me show you another perspective. Let me provide a heavenly uh, and eschatological perspective on what it is uh, you are seeing so that you will be able to respond to it and live in it in a new light. Uh, As a prophecy, the second literary feature of Revelation that we won't talk about a lot, we've uh, discussed prophetic literature in relationship to Old Testament prophecy. But as a prophecy, uh, a Revelation then, in line with Old Testament prophets, and when you read Revelation carefully, John does claim to, to uh, uh, write in the tradition of and in line with Old Testament prophecies of the past, uh, such as Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Uh, he takes up much of their uh, uh, writings and now utilizes them and integrates them into his own work. So uh, Revelation as a prophecy Like Old Testament prophetic texts, primarily, I take it, is foretelling or forthtelling and not just or not primarily uh, foretelling. That is, uh, the book of Revelation as a prophecy is the proclamation of a message uh, to the modern readers that will help them uh, deal with their situation. Uh, It's a call for people to... Uh, take seriously their relationship to Jesus Christ and a call for readers to follow Jesus Christ no matter what the consequences, not just a prediction of events to take place in the future. In the future. I- any approach to Revelation that starts with that perspective that this is a prediction of future events has misunderstood its literary type. It, it's a prophecy. Uh, that is, it's a pr- the proclamation of a message of God a message from God, from Jesus Christ to his people to get them to follow Jesus Christ in obedience 
no matter what the consequences. So it's a message for their situation. But, but also, like Old Testament prophets, it's a message rooted in history. Again, this is not fantasy literature, but it's uh, however much it is uh, rooted in symbolic language in this heavenly perspective, it's still about the reader's situation in a given historical context and historical situation. So we should expect Revelation to be referring to actual events, actual persons, actual places in the first century, but also in the future as well however symbolically and however metaphorically they, those might be uh, described. And finally, we've already said that uh, the book of Revelation is also a letter. It, it clearly begins like a letter. It clearly ends just like one of Paul's letters. Uh, it, it's even po entirely possible, perhaps the author, given the importance of Paul's letters in Asia Minor and uh, the... the uh, uh, Greco-Roman world of the first century, given the importance of Paul's letters in the first century churches, perhaps the author is in a sense imitating Paul in his letter, letter format because of the importance that played. But having said that, at the, at the least, what this means as a letter, if we take this seriously as a letter, and I think we should, that means that Revelation is just as occasional as any of Paul's letters. Uh, that is, we must understand Revelation in light of the historical context and the historical cultural background that caused this letter to be written, this apocalypse to be recorded for the readers. We must read it in light of the specific problems that it was addressing. And we must see Revelation as a response to very specific situations and circumstances and problems in the first century just as much as Paul's letters were, just as much as Peter's letters, or just as much as the letter of James was. Unfortunately, most ignore this uh, feature of the book of Revelation that roots it in its original historical context. But uh, I would argue we need to take it seriously. Now, what does this mean for interpretation of the book of Revelation. And I just want to highlight a handful of uh, uh, what I think are principles that arise out of the literary genre that should guide us in reading it. And uh, much of what I'm going to say also applies to the only other canonical apocalypse, and that is uh, the book of Daniel. And uh, by the way, just as sort of an aside again, I, know I have a lot of these uh, uh, throughout the lectures, but as another aside, it's important to realize that uh, while there may be other books in the New and Old Testament that include apocalyptic type language, uh, actually Daniel and Revelation are the only true apocalypses, that is, that record an actual visionary experience of a reader. Uh, other places like Matthew 24 and 25 or other, other texts that are often called apocalyptic, in a sense, aren't because they don't really record the visionary experience of a reader, or, or I'm sorry, of an author, uh, although they might include eschatological language or apocalyptic type language. Ezekiel is the other text that probably, I, I think, most clearly resembles an apocalypse, in, in especially chapters 40 through 48 that do clearly record a visionary experience of an author. In fact, Paul, uh, John himself draws heavily on Ezekiel, probably for that reason. Uh, but uh, much, much of what I'm going to say could apply to Daniel also, but it will be primarily uh, focused on interpreting the book of Revelation. But the first, uh, the first thing to note that I think uh, clearly uh, uh, emerges from the type of literature that Revelation is as an apocalypse is that we must be alert to the symbolism of Revelation. Now Revelation does, and Daniel does as well, but Revelation refers, as we've said, to actual events and actual persons. Uh, it, it describes actual events, I would argue, in the first century. Again, Revelation is trying to make sense of the reader's own situation. But it also refers to actual events that will transpire in the future, especially in the eschatological future, at the wrap-up of history. But 
in describing actual events, it describes them through metaphorical and symbolic language. It does not describe them literally. Uh, reading Revelation is not like watching a, a CNN news documentary or for a BBC uh, documentary on something, some world event. Uh, but instead, it's more like looking at a painting or an artistic impression. Uh, uh, Revelation, again, communicates symbolically. It refers to actual events, but it refers to those events through symbols and images, not literally. Probably the, the, the closest analogy, modern-day analogy to Revelation, and again, this is not original with me, uh, I found it in several works, but I found it helpful. That is to compare Revelation to a political cartoon. A political cartoon, if you've ever read one, a political cartoon is, is, is a commentary on and is referring to actual historical events, political events and persons. But when you read a political cartoon, you'll notice that it, it uses graphic symbols and images. And sometimes it... it, it it uses exaggeration and caricature to get across its point. Instead of just a, a, a paragraph of, narr of prose narration of what's going on politically, a, a straightforward description, a political cartoon is a more effective way to get across a certain perspective on the political situation. And sometimes the images are, are, are even, at times the images are, are sometimes stock images that we, we know what they mean. So at least in the uh, United States, co uh, context of the United States of America and their political system, if you're reading a political cartoon and you see an eagle, you know that that symbolizes the United States of America. If you see a donkey or an elephant, those aren't referring to literal animals. They're symbolic of two political par parties, the uh, Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, so... Uh, and even when physical persons are portrayed uh, in, in the uh, political cartoon, they're often exaggerated and, and caricatured so that you kind of get the point and you can identify who they are. Uh, so the point about political cartoons is while they refer to actual historical events, things happening in, in, in history and in time, the author describes them in highly graphic and symbolic language so that you will get the point and you'll see it in a new light. That's what Revelation does. A Revelation, like a political cartoon, is a commentary on historical events, things going on in the reader's day and things that will transpire in the future, but depicting them in highly graphic symbolic language so that the readers will get the point to sort of cast a new light on the situation to affect their, not just intellectually, but aesthetically and emotionally, so that they'll respond in a different way. I was raised, so, so Revelation communicates symbolically, that's very important. I, I was raised in the context that said, you need to interpret Revelation literally unless there's really good reason not to. That should be turned on its head. And in light of the kind of literature Revelation is, I think better is, we should interpret Revelation symbolically unless there's really good reason not to. So first of all is the need to come to grips with the symbolism. Uh, in our next session, we'll look a little bit more detail at that and give some examples and illustrations of uh, how uh, uh, interpreting Revelation symbolically uh, would work and how symbols function and what they do and how we should read them. This is Dr. Dave Mathewson in his hermeneutics course, lecture number 20 on the apocalyptic genre.